Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Carrie Mokowski, Director of Education here at FAIR, and I am delighted to be your moderator for today's discussion around food safety. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few quick things. Please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees are going to be muted throughout the presentation. However, this is not going to stop you from joining in on the conversation today. Everyone should see a Zoom toolbar. It's in black and it's at the bottom of your screen. Specifically in this toolbar, you'll see kind of a Q&A button. You can use this to communicate directly with me. Please let me know if you are having any technical difficulties and I'll do my best to help you out. But most importantly, you can use this feature to ask questions to our expert panelists. We've built in some time at the end of the discussion for a few moderated questions. So please feel free to send them my way at any time throughout the presentation. And if time permits at the end, I will pass them along to our presenters. So with all of that said, and at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Gable, Chief Executive Officer at FAIR, who will get the conversation started. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. And this is really an important time for us to have this critical conversation. We know that on any given day, food safety is top of mind for those living with food allergies. COVID-19 and the recent FDA guidance brought this topic front and center to consumers across the country. So due to the recent events, FAIR engaged in discussions with leaders and subject matter experts closest to the issue. And we're so excited that today we are joined by four individuals who dedicate their jobs to the safety of America's food supply chain and who represent the companies that make the food we put on our tables every day. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Donna Guerin, Executive Vice President in Science of, of Science and Policy with the American Frozen Food Institute. We also have my good friend of many years, Dr. Deborah Miller, who is Senior Vice President, Science and Regulatory Affairs with the National Confectioners Association. Lee Sanders, Senior Vice President, Government Relations and Public Affairs with the American Bakers Association. And Joe Skameka, who is the Senior Vice President, Regulatory and Scientific Affairs with the International Dairy Food Association. What I'd love to do is have each of our guests have an opportunity to share a little bit about who they are and what they do. So uh, Dr. Guerin, let's start with you. Sure, and thank you, Lisa, for allowing us to participate in this um, Zoom webinar. It's um, fantastic to, to be here in front of your members and, and participate in this education session. Um, so I'm Dr. Donna Guerin, as Lisa mentioned, and I'm Executive Vice President of science and policy for the American Frozen Food Institute. Um, so over, I'm over both the legislative and regulatory affairs programs for our organization. Um, and we represent obviously the frozen food sector uh, from farm to table and um, have membership all along the supply chain. So this was a very important issue for us and our membership. Great, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Thank you to FAIR for inviting uh, the confectioners uh, to be part of this conversation. Again, my name is Deborah Miller and I'm Senior Vice President for Science and Regulatory Affairs for the National Confectioners Association. Um, and uh, uh, my job uh, is to help our industry, help the candy makers uh, and our favorite sweet treat makers of America uh, to navigate the, the, the regulatory world, um, uh, both at the federal, uh, state, and even sometimes local levels. Uh, we even dabble in the international here and there, um, especially on issues of labeling, food safety, and nutrition policy. And there's never a dull moment, I can tell you. And I just want to start out this conversation being really candid. Um, the reason why we really want to participate in this discussion is because confectionery products do contain allergens. Um, you know, there's peanuts and tree nuts and dairy products and confectionery. Um, and it's precisely because of those inclusions and those ingredients that our industry takes allergen management so very seriously. And we go to great controls great lights to control those allergens. So we really appreciate this opportunity uh, to talk a little bit more about that and what we do. Thank you. 
And Lee, I know that you had a major role as, as an organizer of a, of a major industry alliance in addition to your job, so maybe you can talk about both. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks to, to you and the FAIR team uh, for giving us this opportunity today to have this dialogue. That's, it's terrific. Um, beyond being the Senior Vice President for Government Relations and Public Affairs for the American Bakers Association, in that role, just like uh, my colleagues on the phone, I lead our, um, both our legislative and regulatory um, efforts on behalf of the wholesale baking industry. Um, and we're in, we're in all 50 states. We represent about 1,000 uh, facilities and uh, represent almost 800,000 skilled workers. So we, we have a, a big role to play um, in feeding America. Um, as our role, Donna and I are the co-chairs for the Food and Beverage Issue Alliance. And thank goodness we had that framework in place um, as we are facing COVID-19. It served as a terrific platform for communications and dialogue um, with FDA and other government agencies. So um, when we started looking at what we needed to do to address all the different issues that would impact our, our respective industries, how we could best manage, and of course, keeping food safety as our number one priority as it always is. And then also um, keeping all of our, our sectors operational um, so that we can feed American consumers and then also keep our employees safe. So as we've done that, as we looked at what was needed in these uncertain times, um, the Food and Beverage Issue Alliance and being able to work with our colleagues around the table was really helpful as we were having discussions with FDA and other government agencies, especially when it comes to this uh, ingredient labeling flexibility guidance. Great, thank you so much. And Joe, why don't you introduce yourself? And Joe, I know that you've worked in a lot of companies. Maybe you can add that to the mix just to give people an idea of, of the extent of your background. And you're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Lisa, and thanks to the FAIR staff for this opportunity, and thanks to all of you out there joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time. And so my name is Joe Sameka, and I am the Senior Vice President for Regulatory and Scientific Affairs for the International Dairy Foods Association. So in that role, I get the opportunity to work with my colleagues in um, working with various uh, regulatory agencies as, we're, as we've been going through this new and you know, incredible journey of COVID-19, and we've collaborated across the industry in not only protecting our workers, but also trying to continue to provide food uh, that's safe to the consumers. So as you indicated, I have worked for a number of companies in my previous roles, uh, starting out with Kraft and then Pillsbury and General Mills. So these companies all produce brands that many consumers trust and consume every day in their lives. And, and frankly, my journey um, as a toxicologist started in the late 1980s when food allergy was just really emerging a, 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 as an issue. And so I've had a longstanding interest in food allergy. I, I've worked with many organizations, including FAIR, and I think this is an incredibly important issue for the food allergic consumer. And we're really happy to be here to help, help shed some light on what the industry is doing to protecting them in their food. Great, thank you so much. And for those who are watching, you know, one thing that, that Joe is modest about is he was one of the people that helped form FARP. And FARP is the organization that really has, was brought into play uh, to focus on, on two primary issues, one of which was, was food allergies. And so, you know, we just so appreciate your dedication to the community. And I know that you worked with some of our predecessor organizations uh, and have a long history with the organization. So for that, we thank you. Um, what we'd love to do is, is get into to, to some questions and answers. Uh, one is, and we're going to start with Lee on this one and then go to Donna, um, is what are your thoughts on the FDA's recent guidance and what can you share with us about what your member companies plan or don't plan to do with that guidance? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, well, we're very appreciative to FDA um, for their partnership as we, as we worked through um, making recommendations on this flexibility. You know, this really, we had dialogues on a very senior level 
for about uh, two months. And the very top priority that all of us had, as I, I mentioned before, was food safety. And so um, just like every day, the bakers, that is their top priority. And so thinking through, you know, uh, if there are, and we're lucky uh, from my discussions that I've had today, there hasn't been a need to use this flexibility, but um, companies will be considering if they need to and, and what that would mean. Certainly we would never introduce uh, a new allergen into uh, as a substitution. Um, we're looking at substitutions or emissions um, if there are disruptions in the supply chain. And so if in the rare instance when that might be needed, um, there would certainly be transparency about any minor ingredient that would need to be substituted. Um, I think that, you know, it's, uh, we know from our discussions with you all that brands, you all are very brand loyal and, um, and certainly brands are our livelihood. And so we want to uh, make sure that everything we're doing will reassure um, the allergen community um, that we're making informed choices and, um, and doing the right thing. Great, Donna. And Donna, maybe you can talk a little bit to the types of situations in particular that were popping up related to this. And, and one thing, even before you answer, I just want to say how thankful we are um, as, as consumers of all the work that you all did during COVID. No one expected all this to go on. And we're just so grateful that you and your colleagues uh, were giving thought and care to this as, as you were attempting to get food on the shelves. But perhaps you can go into some specifics. Sure. Yes, it's definitely interesting times we're living in and early in the pandemic when all of us were sent home and, and but we were seeing essential workforce in the food and, and, and beverage industry continue to work to tr supply food uh, so that there wasn't that uh, feeling of insecurity of not having food, but we were seeing signs that there were going to be shortages in certain products. Um, and that's when, and Lee is, is being very modest, Lee, you know, immediately stepped in um, and was burning the midnight oil for months, trying to gather input from all the trade associations that are part of the Food Beverage Issues Alliance um, to, to see what individual sectors were seeing in the way of potential shortages that might lead to possible need for a substitution and omission. Um, and as Lee mentioned, even our members um, have not really seen the, the need to, to use this flexibility, but um, it is there. I, and to Lee's and, and, and Joe and Deborah's uh, case, food safety for our members is um, the number one thing they think of. And that includes allergens and making sure that um, you know, we comply with all the regulatory requirements that are part of um, allergen control. And that didn't stop with COVID. Um, and it won't stop with the implementation of this flexibility. Um, we, as, as an industry and our member companies, we care about making sure that our products are safe for all consumers. And um, that was a, our guiding principle throughout this whole discussion with FDA. And we were so appreciative. I mean, I know this sounds odd, but appreciative from an industry standpoint that there were strict guardrails um, associated with the use of this flexibility um, because we want a considerable thought by companies um, if they did need to use this, that they would have guardrails of which they could use this, again, this flexibility and um, and not even going beyond and the expansion into those beyond the big eight allergens. You know, we were very appreciative and, and accepting of that consideration by FDA. So I think early on, it was a great collaborative effort with FDA. Um, and, you know, they had questions for us and, and we tried to answer. It was a back and forth dialogue, very um, collaborative. So um, we hope the end result will mean that um, we'll have a continuation of continue to supply food to those in, in, in need and um, that they're safe. 
because um, that is our, our number one priority. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to go to Deborah next. And one thing for folks who are watching, uh, I should fully disclose that National Confectioners Association last year underwrote research uh, with, uh, with FAIR uh, that was conducted by Dr. Ruchi Gupta on precautionary allergen labeling. And we're very grateful for that. We're going to be rolling out that information to you all um, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but Deborah and I have worked together for many years. And so she was my go-to person for a lot of these questions. And Deborah, maybe you can speak to even considerations uh, beyond the top eight moving into the European guidelines to make sure things were fully covered and and some of the conversations you and I had over the last number of weeks during this this big questionable time period. Sure uh, thank you Lisa um, you know thank you for mentioning uh, the, the work we've done together it's uh, been really important to the confectionery industry um, you know, as uh, you know, I hope uh, as everybody else has, has indicated, and I'll just say again, um, food safety and consumer trust are critically important to our industry. Um, the food allergic consumer specifically, we understand um, that you have trust in us, and we need to maintain that trust. And you have, and we and we need to maintain your ability to make informed choices on the products that you purchase. And we know you rely on us to provide access to that information to make those really important choices. I mean, these are choices that are life and death for you. We understand that this is a huge, um, a, a, you know, a, a huge responsibility. Um, and uh, so that's why uh, the allergen, uh, addressing allergen issues and communication and claims um, and statements on products, um, labeling for precautionary statements has been a top priority which is why we also entered with the study uh, with, with FAIR and uh, the team at Northwestern, who have been fantastic. Um, the recent, recent guidance and flexibility, you know, it, it addressed a real problem, a real potential concern of ingredient shortages um, around the world. Um, uh, Lisa mentioned, you know, this is a, a, the, the, there are concerns all around the world um, about, uh, about uh, food allergens, uh, but in the time of COVID-19, where uh, many of us have global food food supply chains, um, you know, it was very uh, unknown what would happen. Um, and so I might take my hat off to Donna and Lee for for leading the effort to uh, try to get ahead of uh, of uh, interruptions that could make could have made major. Uh, uh, interruptions in the food supply to Americans and around the world, um, and they did a great job. Uh, and as they said, addressing the issue of allergen was the top concern in all the conversations that I was part of. Um, it was considered job one. Um, and the confectioner confectionery industry supports this guidance as it provides um, needed flexibility if it is needed. Um, as, as noted, um, it has not been needed at this time, as far as I'm aware. Um, and, uh, you know, for that, and that said, uh, we're not foreseeing any widespread COVID-19 related changes or disruptions. Um, but if future disruptions um, would arise, um, we would certainly uh, encourage members to consult with us and, and us to consult with FAIR or members to cons consult with FAIR um, directly if, uh, if and when that's appropriate. Um, we, we want to do all those things to maintain trust and transparency. Thank you. And, and Joe, you've been doing this for a long time. I, and my, I'm feeling like we've never seen anything like this before, but I know that uh, for folks who've been involved in the space, I'm sure there are other instances, there are things that you've encountered, reasons as to how you set parameters up so many years ago around allergens. We look forward to, to hearing from you next. Thanks, Lisa. And I, I you know, want to just really echo the remarks of my colleagues that food safety is really job number one in the food industry. And it, it is something that we take very seriously. We always have and we always will, regardless of COVID-19. And, um, you know, the association I represent, the Dairy Association, covers the full range of dairy foods. Uh, ice cream, yogurt, and culture products, milk products, cheese, and then dairy ingredients. And dairy ingredients go into many, many different products. And then many of the products that our members sell contain a number of allergens. So allergens has been an issue they've been dealing with for a long time. They're really familiar with it. They have lots of controls and procedures and, and to make sure that those allergens are prevented from getting into foods where they shouldn't be, or if they are added to the food intentionally, that they are declared. So um, the, the other thing I just wanna point out 
that isn't often recognized is that employees of the food industry are also consumers. And many of those consumers have food allergies or they have members of their families with a food allergy. And so they're in a position to be working with the food every day. They know how serious food allergy is and they're in, in, in a position to do something about it. And so in every company that I've worked for and every plant I visited, all the workers are very, very familiar with how important food allergy is and take those controls very seriously. So I don't think anything's been changed since COVID-19 with regard to how the food industry views food allergy. And certainly this additional guidance isn't going to change that either. So I'm um, going to thank you very much. And we'll, we'll go to our next question, which is that we'd love to have you all share your thoughts about your members' commitment to protecting and providing safe and healthy foods. And I know one question also that's bubbled up, and I was just looking at the chat, and we'll go to those questions soon. But since it popped a few times is, the question was, when the FDA was, was issuing this guidance, uh, how were you all consulted and how were companies notified that this was going on? So perhaps you could share with us your, your thoughts about your members' commitments, but also speak to sort of the process itself. So Lee, would you like to go? Sure, absolutely. Well, um, any, anything that we do is certainly member-driven. And so when we were talking through our priorities, talking through um, where our members might need regulatory flexibility. Um, we talked through the approach with our members. And so certainly food safety, not introducing new allergens were top priority. And then thinking about, and just as, as Joe had mentioned, and I think others as well, um, our ingredient suppliers are global. And so kind of anticipating the unanticipated was something that we were working on. So the dialogue that, that we had in kind of teasing that out, looking at that, thinking of different scenarios was really helpful when we're having our, our dialogue with, with FDA and, and, and with our members. And so um, we knew that this, um, this flexibility, it would only be used if it was absolutely necessary to keep uh, production going, to keep food on the shelves. But we also realize that there may be some products that um, if there isn't a substitution, you, you may see fewer um, types of bakery products on the shelf. Um, and so every member um, thinks about that uh, if they were gonna have to consider um, making, making any changes. I think that you know, we've had a great opportunity through our dialogues um, with you and with FDA to think about um, how we can best help your members in communicating with our members about the um, concerns you all have, knowing, understanding the importance of, of branded products and, um, and even and, and beyond that. And so being able to um, to talk to our members about that. I've had a great opportunity over the last couple of weeks to talk to our technical committee, to talk to our board of directors, um, to talk about, you know, we, that we were pleased to get this regulatory flexibility, but certainly knowing that none of them would be using it unless it was absolutely necessary, hoping that we never have to use it. Um, but, but having confidence that uh, since food safety is our number one priority, that there are procedures in place um, that will assure that um, food safety is number one, looking at FSMA, looking at FALPA, keeping all those things in place. Um, we certainly would not intentionally introduce an allergen. We don't want to put ourselves into a, a recall situation. Um, and, and so I think that um, with the guardrails, as Donna mentioned, uh, and, and uh, trying to anticipate uh, what may lie ahead has helped us, you know, be focused and and um, and transparent through the process. Donna, would you like to give your thoughts? Sure. I mean, it, it is all about transparency, and I think you know, knowing I, I have a son who has a nut allergy, and um, knowing what's in the ingredient label is important. And um, we, as companies uh, or associations that represent companies, we 
feel strongly you've you've got to ensure that trust and transparency uh, otherwise people will vo avoid those food if they don't have that trust so in regards to our efforts in regards to communicating this to our members it's similar to lee and that is through constant engagement to find out you know how this is being used if this would be used um, and uh, you know we are seeing right now that there is a there is a need um, and, and many of our products are not branded um, in in our category they are store brands and um, so there's a confidence there that you also want to make sure that store brands are also um, labeling appropriately and correctly so that communication uh, between the brand owner and 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 our in our case our members that make for that brand um, is very important and um, because again there's trust even you know with all the brands including store brands so um, food safety is an everyday thing and including making sure that even during this pandemic and potential shortages that the food there's a confidence that the food is safe and we need to make sure that we maintain that. Thank you. You know, Deborah, as we, um, one thing we hear a lot about is the second wave. And I think when you and I spoke, one of the issues about the guidance had been not related to what's going on here and now beyond spices and uh, some cleaning solutions, uh, but, but it was actually the second wave, which we're all concerned as we do risk management for our organizations. Can you speak to that? Speak to, again, that sort of the commitment of your members, which you've talked to because you all help sponsor this research, and sort of any key facts that might help the, the folks size this up. I've noticed a lot of questions, and the biggest concern we're hearing is beyond the top eight. So, you know, if somebody's allergic to sunflowers, which was one of the examples, or something else, what can they expect to see? And, and do you see any issues around those types of things? Sure, I'll say what I what I what I know about uh, uh, about the crystal ball of the future. Uh, and uh, thanks again for for referencing our work with Fair. So I I, um, I I'll, I'll talk about that for a second, just to underscore your you know your question uh, uh, was a lot about what is our commitment as an industry uh, to uh, the food allergic community. And uh, you know we have been working with Fair um, and the group at Northwestern for a number of years. Um, uh, to investigate the most relevant and helpful allergen labeling for the food allergic community. Um, and it's really exciting to see your leadership, Lisa, uh, taking this uh, to uh, uh, you know, a, a much greater awareness uh, and uh, you know, in pursuit of a more harmonized precautionary label statement. We think that that is um, a real service uh, both to the food allergic community and also to the food industry. Um, the more that we can be um, as harmonized and clear, uh, the better for all of us to be able to communicate um, and keep that transparency, which is just so key here. Um, and we, we're very excited to continue to work with FAIR and be supportive of this initiative. And I think part of that initiative, uh, Lisa, um, it, and I, I, at, from working with you over many years, I know you are capable of, uh, of creating awareness um, about the other issues that you mentioned, um, uh, additional allergens outside of the, uh, the, the big eight or nine as we're debating, um, and other, uh, other concerning factors um, uh, about sensitivities that uh, I'm sure your population has questions about. So um, I would just like to congratulate FAIR for choosing the right leader. Um, if there's anyone who can take this over the finish line, uh, to get that attention, to get that awareness, um, to bring attention to this cause, it will be Lisa Gable. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the confectionery industry will be right there with you. Um, you know, I mentioned at my outset to being candid that we are very engaged because a lot of confectionery products, I mean, they're super yummy. Uh, everybody loves them. We're here to make your day um, every day um, in a small way. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that th those are safe. And, you know, we understand that some ingredients are of concern and they need to be properly labeled, they need to be properly communicated. Um, and so I think um, if all of us work together um, to make sure that awareness um, continues uh, and um, in our works in, in our work in Washington uh, to advocate uh, for um, harmonized labeling and, uh, and um, increased um, you know, attention to this issue, I think we can make all of this happen.
And Joe, you get to be the uh, the closer on on this. is is about commitment, about safety, about communication. I think that's the big thing I'm seeing on all the questions is communication. How do we know if you make a change? How am I going to know you made a change? Sure. Uh, so uh, before I get to that, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what my colleagues were saying about communicating um, to the uh, uh, our members uh, about this guidance and. And I know that you heard from our um, co the colleagues here, but within IDFA, I also want to point out that when this guidance came out, we were um, careful to communicate the use of this guidance to our members. We disseminated the guidance and we also provided direction on how it should be used. Because um, in fact, there are guardrails around this guidance that are very clear. One of those that may not be fully appreciated is the FDA does not permit the use of this flexibility for products that fall under a standard of identity. It turns out that many, many dairy foods do have a standard of identity along with other products. So we wanted to ensure that our members realize that. And then we just reiterated the need for them to continue with the various food allergy programs that they have in place. So we, we have a manual that we have given to our members that it's available to our members that really provides a step-by-step -step guidance on how to control allergens. So we just reiterated that message. We also conduct yearly training in food allergy control and labeling in the need to be transparent. And when we do that label, that training again, um, which we did last time with uh, Penn State University with their ice cream course that they hold, um, we'll, we'll do it in the future. We'll talk about this FDA guidance. We'll ensure that our members understand exactly what those guardrails are and the need to be transparent with the consumer should they find the need to use this flexibility. As you've heard, it's true with our members as well. I am not aware of any dairy food members that have yet to use this flexibility. But if, if it does become necessary going forward, uh, given how this COVID-19 plays out, we'll be careful to put all the necessary precautions in place to ensure that we're not putting the food allergic consumer at risk. And that includes working with our suppliers of this new ingredient, right? So we will go through the normal supplier verification procedures whenever you have a new supplier. And we will ensure that they have an allergen control plan. So there's no cross contact in that new ingredient that we may need to use and that they disclose the presence of any allergens in that ingredient that we are purchasing from them. But as I said, we have not yet felt the need to do that. And uh, for the majority of dairy products, we're not allowed to make a substitution. So I just wanted to um, point out those, um, those uh, relevant comments about this guidance. Great, and we had one question, which is explain the standard of identity. And I'm gonna to confess to everybody that 10 years ago when I moved into the pin bed fridge space, I didn't understand what it was. I actually kept a note in my, in my Rolodex that told me what it was. But Joe, can you tell us all what standard of identity means and what kinds of products are affected by it? Sure, the standard of identity is something that's defined in the regulation in a way that it characterizes exactly how the product must be composed or in some cases even produced. And uh, it, it specifies what ingredients must be in the product. I uh, may specify how the product is made, as I was saying. So uh, examples of products like that are many ice creams fall under uh, standard of identity. Yogurt falls under a standard of identity. So there is no flexibility in, for our members in changing the ingredients used in those products under this guidance by the FDA. Thank you. And I know uh, one of the examples I was always given is chocolate. And chocolate also has a standard of identity in Belgium or some other countries and has its own, own elements to it. And that was, that was new to me. And I, I know that's new to some of the folks on here. Uh, as we, before we move into the Q&A, we're just going to talk a little bit about cleaning protocols. We went through uh, lots of different government regulations on food safety and all of that changed. And I know that I've had the opportunity to be in my steel toed boots and my goggles down on the floor of some of your your members' uh, factories, but maybe you can just tell us a little bit about cleaning pro protocols and, and how that uh, fits within the context of allergens. And Donna, I'm just going to mix it up a bit. We'll start with you. Okay. 
Um, Joe probably has the most hands-on experience with these kind of programs being in the plant for so many years. Um, but, uh, you know, as part of now even FISMA, there are certain requirements related to if you have an allergen in your plant, what type of sanitation program you have to have in place. Um, it could include both cleaning in between allergens or it could be potentially scheduling line runs, um, it, meaning that they run one product that doesn't have an allergen and say the, the product that has an allergen into the last so that you avoid those kind of cross uh, contact issues um, associated with sanitation. So they're constantly monitoring those and those are all planned out. Those are sanitation programs that they've assessed the ingredients in all the products to determine what are the risk factors. Um, and allergen being one of those is, is one. And they also make sure that there's not microbial contamination, um, physical contamination, um, chemical contamination. So there's, and, and obviously that's where allergens um, come into play. So they have to consider that it, before setting out even manufacturing food. So all their programs for control are based on that, but the sanitation is probably the most key um, in regards to control of cross contact. Joe Great. probably can really elaborate way more than that. Joe, if you're the expert, and unless yeah, yeah. Deborah and Lee really want to talk about sanitation, I'm going to let <laughs> Joe answer. And then we have so many questions, if it's okay with you guys, I might let Joe uh, finish out our, our standard questions and then move to the questions from the floor. Sure, thanks. And I don't know if I'm truly an expert, but I have been involved in many plants and helping them create their allergen control programs. And, and, and Donna summarized it very well on, it's almost a military precision in how these plants control allergens. And there are procedures and, and schedules and exactly how the plant's going to produce products that may have an allergen in it. If there is an allergen in a particular product, then we try to make that product at the end of the shift, right before the sanitation. The sanitation procedures in themselves are very prescribed on exactly how the equipment needs to be torn down, cleaned, the kinds of chemicals that need to be used. And then there is a validation procedure. So initially, when a plant decides to bring an allergen into a plant on a particular line, they go ahead and try to run it before they commercialize the product and they will clean between the allergen products and then test to see if the cleaning truly was efficacious. They'll test to see if there's any cross contact and they'll validate that cleaning procedure. So once the cleaning procedure is validated, then they, once they commercialize the product going forward, they make sure every time they do sanitation, they are following each and every step exactly according to that protocol and someone has to sign off that everything was done according to that validated protocol. That way we know the sanitation is effective and being done every time between allergens. So very prescribed, very exact procedures in, in all the plants. Right, well, Lisa, may I add one other thing? I would agree with ev what everyone else has said. Um, you know, supplier verification is so important and testing is that proof and verification is really key as we're doing this. But the other thing besides what we're doing internally is that we're having audits. We have GFSI audits, we have independent audits, so that that proof and that verification um, is really, is really uh, also part of that plan. Great, thank you very much for clarifying that. That's so helpful. Deborah, you got anything to add on, on the cleaning or would you like to move on to the questions? I would only add that um, um, people may wonder what we trade association people do. Um, you know, you may, you may know or you have an idea what food manufacturers do, but part of our role is, um, is to help with education uh, and guidance on uh, all of these issues. So I'm not gonna repeat um, everything because it was uh, wonderfully put by Donna Lee and Joe. Uh, but we do play a role in education, and um, there certainly are a lot of training programs that a lot of um, our groups uh, put together, um, our, in, our member companies 
um, are very committed to training their employees. So everything, all the complexities that Joe and Donna and Lee just put out, uh, uh, there's also an extensive training uh, for employees um, as they come into being a workers in these facilities. And many of our groups um, help uh, to run some of those trainings, uh, coordinate those. And also we helped, like uh, many have said, to educate on new, um, on, on new guidance, on new regulations as they, as they emerge. So um, I think uh, the, the training and certification and all those programs um, are, are really important and key to the whole process. Great, and I appreciate that. And that's one reason we wanted you all on today to, to give a face uh, for our community of the people who think about this day in and day out, because I know that the allergen issues are a key part of your jobs and it's what it is that you all follow and what you do. And so we wanted them to understand who were their champions within the companies and champions within the larger industry to ensure that your voices get heard, you being the folks who are watching today. You guys got lots of questions, so I'm gonna toss the baton over to Carrie. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa, and, and thank you to all of our panelists. We have a very active audience here today, which is awesome. So they're engaged and, and thankful that you're joining the conversation and that you really do appreciate the anxiety, um, you know, that this has definitely caused in the community, particularly for those uh, managing allergens outside of the top eight. So I'll just get right to it. Um, a couple of people asked, and I'll summarize and put it all together around the topic of substitutions and the process of informing people. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone can speak to if, let's say, a substitution is used, you know, will it then be listed on a label? And is there any kind of guidance or advice that you can share with parents? Because Lee, someone had mentioned and appreciated that you really did point out and recognize how brand loyal the allergy community is. You know, and once they do find a brand and it's safe, they want to stick to it. They demand it from their local grocery store. So, you know, if a substitution is made, do you know or can anyone speak to how the consumer will be informed? I'm happy to start, Lee, if you want me to. <laughs> sure, and, I, and I'll, I'll follow up. That sounds okay. good. So, um, you know, obviously the products in regards to the QR code and the, what we call the smart label, um, uh, those informations. And so technically it could be in the, it won't be necessarily in the ingredient statement because those are already run through. But um, if a change has been made, it can be communicated through the smart label um, and banners have already been made to make sure that that would be available to those that that use the smart label so that it can be easily found by those that are seeking that information. But also the company's websites um, are also a very valuable thing um, in regards to communicating this to our members. It, it primarily will be those associated with the website and, and providing that information of changes. Um, as well as those that potentially they are co-branded for, such as a retail brand. Um, and retail brands are, are very much wanting to be as transparent as us in the food industry. Um, and I know um, Lee has talked to many retailers and has some ideas in regards to point of sale alternatives to ingredient statements on the labels. Yeah, so what I would add there is um, definitely the, the website um, statement to, to show if there had been some substitution or even an omission. Um, and then also, um, if when possible, certainly changing that packaging, sometimes that may not be possible. So then you could also alternative maybe have stickers. Problem with stickers is sometimes they fall off. So one of the things that our members had also talked about were shelf talkers, which is something, and you may have seen that, you know, right now, at, at least at the beginning, when you were having trouble finding toilet paper, you were also having trouble finding bread and flour and things like that. And so there would be a sign up there on the shelf that said, you know, out of stock. And so you could use that same kind of signage that would, that would indicate to folks that there had been a, a change or a substitution or even an omission. If, if I can just point out something as well, that if there should be a shortage in an ingredient, it, it will probably be a very broad based shortage. You know, if there was just one supplier that wasn't able to provide a particular ingredient, well, most of our, you know, members are able to switch to other suppliers. So there would have to be a very broad shortage across 
of you know the full supply base and therefore it would affect many many products many different categories of products and so this would just not be a single product in isolation it would be a pretty broad event and so the the transparency and the communication would be a lot easier to get to the consumer with such a broad event so i wouldn't expect to see single products having to make um you know a change because of an ingredient short shortage wonderful that's helpful and and actually if you don't mind uh just because a few people have kind of asked about stickers and lee you just mentioned that and and you know the issue of maybe them falling out but a few people have reiterated joe what you said you know just about transparency and they were just wondering and i'll ask the group you know can do you think manufacturers can commit to adding a sticker warning um, if a substitution is made you know i think a lot of our attendees are thinking that that's kind of a, a logical um, answer if anyone can just speak a bit more to that i would say um you know our, our members certainly i think the first stop based on what the guidance has suggested is um certainly labeling if it's possible or stickering then also that website i think the website is where you're going to be able to have the most up-to-date information um i think that um also the the signage like i talked about is is something that is visible um it's uh the other thing in talking with our members that they are very um they would encourage uh, allergic consumers if if they see something on the website if they see a sticker if they see a shelf talker and they want more information call that number on the package they'll they're more than willing to talk to you about um, that that change um, the procedures in that facility what else is made in that facility you know that's something when they're going through and looking at their plan for every single product the production and how to keep there from being cross contact. They have all that information for each product line in each facility. Wonderful, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, next question, this is kind of around um, someone, someone asking about a dairy allergy. Do we know, um, do people with dairy allergies have to worry that milk may be substituted in products? Well, I'm not exactly sure what, what the basis is for that question. Would milk be substituted for some other non-milk ingredient? If that's the question, well then, you know, we would have to disclose that, right? So through the sticker or shelf talker or, or website so if that were to happen which frankly i don't see it but if it were to happen uh yes it would be it would be disclosed to the consumer thank you joe um this is a question around kind of cleaning procedures um how has the cleaning of lines or actually any you know facility work changes how has that impacted allergens on the lines that perhaps aren't listed as ingredients or as in a substitution or omission using this guidance i believe so yes yeah. so um they wouldn't change i mean they would just be additive in regards to their food safety effort so just like substituting ingredients in normal times <laughs> um not this pandemic we're living through they would have to go through just what joe mentioned in regards to and joe and lee um, and deborah so that you actually are evaluating that ingredient and that change of ingredient potentially um, evaluating your production lines in your sanitation programs because technically potentially the hazard has changed so um, all those changes, that's why, you know, it's likely not to be used very often unless it's a sense of emergency because um, there are rules that every company has to abide to in regards to changes of ingredients normally. 
Um, and when you make a change, you have to update your plans and have to update your sanitation. So all that would kick in and, and that's not an easy task for companies uh, to do. So um, if, if at all possible, they'll try to avoid making those type of substitutions um, and ingredient changes because it requires a lot of thought and thinking into changes that facility has to make. And if I could elaborate a little bit about that, what Donna is referencing are the food safety plan. So every plant must have a food safety plan. This is required by FDA's regulations. Part of that, that food safety plan is the necessity to conduct a hazard analysis. It's the first step that you do in creating your plan. So that means looking at all the ingredients and any hazards that they could bring into the product. Allergens are a clearly defined hazard category. So any change in your ingredients would trigger that hazard analysis. You would have to go through a step-by-step -step analysis and look at the ingredient. Does it bring a new allergen into that product? And then if so, you have to put all the controls that we've talked about already in place. The supplier verification, the sanitation, cleaning, everything that flows from that. So any change, no matter how small to the product, must it triggers a reevaluation of the food safety plan. Wonderful, thank you. And again, thank you all for your time. And, and I think we'll just ask one more question just to stay on time. Um, some people have, have asked, and we often hear it up there, and, and that's great advice to call the manufacturers and call their call centers. What, what advice can you give to a parent who does do that? And then, you know, when they bring up this new FDA guidance, um, you know, they find that the company isn't really sure what they're talking about. And that, you know, how, are, how could you let them know or advise them that they are getting an answer that's accurate if they're kind of getting a little pushback that, you know, they're unaware of this FDA guidance? I think that might be a, a, a a factor of the call center, not getting the same information as the individuals that me and my colleagues on this call talk to. So the food safety, quality assurance, uh, labeling folks, we're, we're talking with them. Um, and, you know, so I, I think if you do get that kind of response from a call center, um, is to ask them to call you back and have someone um, that is in their QA department um, facilitate that conversation because the QA people out there, they are very quality assurance folks that are in charge of food safety are, um, are very aware of, of this flexibility. So I think that's a follow-up call, I would suggest. Um, I'm, I'm open to other colleagues and what their thoughts are, but I think it might just be a miscommunication with the call center. Yeah, you're exactly right, Donna. Uh, every company that I've ever worked for, and most of the ones I'm familiar with, there's a very tight linkage between the call center and the food safety quality assurance department. And, and actually, the call center employees are trained that uh, they follow kind of a, a, a um, prescribed responses to questions. And anything that goes outside of the boundary of those responses, they're told to just get the caller's information, and then separately, that person then will follow up with the food safety QA department and get the kind of detailed information that they need to get back to the caller. So that's the normal procedure. If it's not working, uh, then I would urge you to talk to your uh, call center and ask them to do that. And, and this is, uh, I, I've worked in a, um, some large uh, food manufacturing organizations as well, and that is exactly how um, I've seen it work, as Joe has outlined, it, um, and Don is exactly right. Um, they should uh, either be offering to call you back, or you should be asking for a follow-up. Um, just one other tip, I mean, if, uh, you know, as, as technology has evolved, um, uh, I think Lisa had mentioned the uh, smart label um, and Lee had mentioned smart label um, and, and probably other technologies um, such as, you know, QR codes on products. Uh, and if folks are not using that, those, um, those technologies, um, I encourage you to try them out. Um, I think that may be one of the fastest ways that uh, companies can communicate 
uh, changes, uh, especially in this um, uncertain time as uh, many people are trying to do the right thing as quickly as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, there, there have been some additions to smart, smart Label to allow for these types of communications. So it could be a backup plan um, uh, for uh, understanding um, any changes to products, uh, you know, uh, as well as the 800 numbers, which are usually, in, as, as noted, uh, very well informed. Um, and uh, uh, today, um, everything is a little different, um, but uh, I know they strive to be uh, extremely connected. The other, other thing that I would add is that um, we, uh, you know, through all this, there have been a lot of changes, a lot of flexibilities, um, a lot of uh, regulatory assistance to help us stay operational. I know that um, all of us on the phone and our uh, other colleagues in the food industry have made sure that we have very clear and concise and updated information on our COVID-19 resource pages. Um, and then also um, something new that we developed for our Food and Beverage Issue Alliance was a, a website, feedingus.org. And so um, that's something, that was a landing page that we created just for this, this COVID situation. And it is something um, that FDA has used to refer um, folks to. I think our largest reference point is FDA on that. And we have our commitment statement um, about, um, uh, you know, transparency and the importance of food safety as our, num our number one priority um, and allergens. Um, and that's included there um, for, for all to see. So I think that we've done a really good job keeping people from our perspective, the, the manufacturers informed and up to date, making sure they have all the information that they can make to make informed decisions and new processes that they may need to add, you know, in, in their steps to respond to COVID-19. Wonderful. Thank you all for those tools and guidance and advice. Um, I think we're about at time, so I will pass this back to Lisa. Great. Um, I just want to thank Donna, Deborah, Lee, and Joe for joining us today. Carrie, thank you for always being the ex excellent facilitator of the questions, uh, but particularly want to thank all the participants that we've had. We have kept your questions, and we know there are a lot of them that we may not have been able to answer today. I've got 89 of them. Know that we are tracking those, and my team just confirmed with me that uh, we'll be using those as guideposts to make sure that you're provided with the information that you need. Just to reiterate, just so you all are aware, if you didn't see the video notice we did last week, Ferris talked to over 30 of the largest food and beverage companies in the world combined with the association. So even though not all the associations are represented today, what I can tell you is that we have received a commitment that they will notify us if they anticipate any changes related to allergens. So far, we have been confirming with everyone that there are no changes related to allergens. And so I know that's the greatest fear uh, but that is not what the case is right now. There is, in fact, from the larger manufacturers, a reluctance to change anything because, as Donna pointed out, that sets into motion a series of activities that have to happen, combined with the fact that they want the food that you get to taste the way that you expect it to taste and have the consistency that you need. So changes actually could alter that. Bottom line is we are tracking this. We are committed to trying to work with everyone to get to a place where we can standardize the information, make sure that you all get it as quickly as possible. And we just appreciate the active partnership with the folks who are on our call today. And thank you for joining. Mm -hmm.